is August 30th. It's InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Paul Joseph Watson on tonight's show. Tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News, Aaron Dykes interviews why in the world are they sprains Michael Murphy about how airplanes are filling our skies with more than just travelers. Then, NATO's plot to use ambulances as a cover for humanitarian intervention in Syria is revealed. Plus, caught on tape, not one but two videos of shocking police brutality exposed. All this and more, coming up on the InfoWars Nightly News. First story up tonight, Texas students revolt against mandatory RFID tracking chips. Students and parents at two San Antonio schools are in revolt over a program that forces kids to wear RFID tracking name tags, which are used to pinpoint their location on campus as well as outside school premises. Students at John Jay High School and Anson Jones Middle School will be mandated to wear tags from today, which will be used to track them on campus as well as when they enter and leave school. Andrea Hernandez is leading a group of students who refuse to wear the tags because in her words, it, it quote, it makes me uncomfortable, it's an invasion of my privacy. And so again, this is prisoner training. That's what it amounts to. You've got children being prepared for their introduction into the outside world. They're being indoctrinated to accept that their every movement is being tracked as if it's completely normal, rational thing to be happening. But it's all for the kids' safety, of course, as the school claims. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with the fact that they've got a $2 million check from the government waiting for them if they improve attendance and get rid of truancy. And speaking of prisoner training, I mean, in some ways, schools are becoming more pernicious than jails themselves because, you know, just like in jail, there are surveillance cameras everywhere, there are cops walking around everywhere as there are now in high schools. But you know, at least in jail, you're not being constantly indoctrinated. And on top of that, of course, with schools, we've got the deliberate dumbing down agenda, American kids getting more and more stupid because the system exists to strangle their individuality and stifle their natural talent. And that's what the education systems turn into. So it makes sense you know, when you're a breeding ground for slaves, that you're going to get them used to slavery by having them tracked everywhere. And they're, you know, they're rewarded for regurgitating what they're told to regurgitate. So it's all about this system of turning them into zombies, fresh and ready for the outside zombie slave world so they can fit into their little, you know, they can become their little brick in the wall in the outside world, as it were. So it's obedience training, that's what it is. It's, it's being rewarded for intellectually castrating yourself. That's what the modern, modern education system is all about. And now on top of that, it's being backed up by this prisoner training. We also had the article on Monday, of course, about kids in nine Austin schools being forced to carry around a GPS tracker while having to check in with a mentor uh, numerous times a day. And of course, that's not far removed again from a uh, criminal with a GPS ankle bracelet, you know, having to see a parole officer every day. It's not that far removed at all from just being a criminal in prison. That's the modern school system. And so, again, what's the solution? Well, it's to homeschool your kids and you can do it yourself. You don't need to pay out oodles of money for somebody else to do it. And there's organizations across America that will help you do that. So it's a problem with a solution, uh, but it's great to see that these kids in San Antonio are fighting back from just becoming another brick in the wall by rebelling against this program, which seeks to track them everywhere they go, both on school premises and at home. And, you know, just imagine how open to abuse that is. Remember the case from 2010 in Pennsylvania, where they had the software on the kids' school-issued laptops tracking them, watching them while they were at home. A, a kid actually got disciplined for indecent behavior in his own home because the school officials were watching his webcam. They were watching him through his webcam on his laptop. So there's all kind of sexual predators and people like that out there who are just waiting to take advantage of these surveillance systems being implemented by the schools. But in San Antonio, the kids are rebelling and fighting back against Big Brother. 
Next story, just in case, state of Alaska to stockpile mass amounts of food and supplies in giant warehouses. This is Mac Slava of shtfplan.com. With its remote location and dependence on the uninterrupted flow of supplies from the lower 48 states, the governor of Alaska has made disaster readiness a hallmark of his administration. Governor Sean Parnell worries a major earthquake or volcanic eruption could leave the state 720,000 residents stranded and cut off from food and supply lines. His answer? Build giant warehouses full of emergency food and supplies just in case. For some in the lower 48, it may seem like an extreme step, but Parnell says this is just Alaska. The state plans two food stockpiles in or near Fairbanks and Anchorage, two cities that also have military bases. Construction on the two storage facilities will begin this fall, and the first food deliveries are targeted for December. The goal is to have enough food to feed 40,000 people for up to a week, including three days of ready-to-eat meals and four days of bulk food that can be prepared and cooked for large groups. To put that number into perspective, Alaska's largest city, Anchorage, has about 295,000 people, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, and Juneau, its third largest, about 31,000 people. So, you know, while these food stockpiles are nowhere near enough to cover the population for any significant amount of time, you know, at least it's a start. And so when idiots laugh at you for buying storable food and being a paranoid kook for doing so, just point to the fact that the government's doing it, the government's getting prepared for earthquakes, for natural disasters, for all eventualities. So if they're preparing for it, why on earth shouldn't the citizenry be preparing for it at the same time? I mean, you get so much heat from some people about buying storable food and it being useless waste of money when the government's doing it. I mean, everybody's doing it. And if nothing happens, then you just eat it and save money anyway. So, you know, nobody loses out. Global news now. NATO plot to use ambulances as cover for humanitarian invasion of Syria. A source claims that NATO powers in coordination with Saudi Arabia are putting the finishing touches to a false flag plot to blame President Bashar al-Assad's forces for launching a chemical weapons attack as a precursor to a NATO intervention which will see ambulances as humanitarian cover for a military assault. The source told Syrian news channel Adunia that a Saudi company had fitted 1,400 ambulance vehicles with anti-gas and anti-chemical filtering systems at a cost of $97,000 each in preparation for a chemical weapons attack carried out by FSA rebels using mortar rounds. The further 400 vehicles have been prepared as troop carriers. The attack, which will involve the use of white phosphorus, sarin, and mustard gas, will be launched in a heavily populated town near the Syria-Jordan border, possibly Dara, after which the vehicles will pour in under the cover of humanitarian aid. The ambulances emblazoned with the slogan, Syrian People's Relief, they're friendly, they're humanitarian, nothing to worry about, will operate under the guise of an aid mission to help victims of the chemical weapons attack, but in re reality are nothing short of armored personnel carriers. So according to this source, this has been timed to uh, coincide with the statements we heard over the last week or two from both French President uh, Francois Hollande and, of course, Barack Obama, who both basically came out and said, look, if Syria not just uses, but if Syria merely moves its chemical weapons from one location to another, it's going to trigger an invasion. Forget the UN Security Council. It's going to trigger a military intervention outside of that framework. So the Al-Qaeda-led rebels have been given the gas masks. They've been given the stockpile of chemical weapons seized from Libya, of course, formerly under the control of Gaddafi. And the false flag chemical weapons attack, which many people in the blogosphere have been speculating about for weeks, is very much being prepared according to this source. And of course, it, the international NATO-aligned media will instantly blame it on Assad, just like the Hula massacre was instantly blamed on the Syrian government, despite the fact that, as the German newspaper FAZ documented, it was, in fact, carried out by the loving humanitarian democratic protesters, the NATO-backed rebels. And so, 
from this source, it looks like they're getting ready to launch this chemical weapons attack. Blame it on Assad. And then under the guise of humanitarian aid, bring these 1,800 ambulances in, which in reality are basically armoured personnel carriers chock full of fighters and weapons. And then that will be the initial buffer zone from which the secondary military intervention is launched on the justification that Assad attacked his own people with chemical weapons. We've seen that one before. And again, just to address this issue of state media, because this, com this source comes from Syrian state media, they reported on it. And we'll go on to illustrate this with our next story as well. I see the occasional feedback uh, on the comments, on the Facebook comments and whatever. Basically the tone of, you know, why is Infowars using st Syrian state media as a news source? And isn't it interesting that when you do use something like Syrian news channels or Russia Today, Press TV, whatever it is, you've somehow committed a journalistic war crime, but using something like the New York Times, the very publication whose lies about, you know, weapons of mass destruction, yellow cake, greased the skids for a war which led to the deaths of over a million people, that's the height of credibility. That's perfectly okay to use the New York Times as a source whose lies upon lies upon lies have led to wars and death on a mass scale, but don't dare use a Syrian news channel. That's bad. That's really bad. That's evil. And it's interesting, again, that using foreign media is seen as some kind of dirty, underhanded thing, and yet taking your information from CNN or MSNBC, these new news organizations that literally have to get permission, have to beg the White House to use Obama, Obama's quotes that he's already given them. We saw that story a few weeks ago. That's perfectly acceptable. That's okay to use them as a news source. So we'll continue to, to use you know, news sources from a vast array of media and make no apologies for it. And it's up to you, the reader, to decide whether it's credible or not, whether it comes from state media or not, and whether that matters. Because as we see with the next story, Operation Mockingbird 2012, New York Times writes a leak story critical of Obama to CIA. This is Steve Watson, Infowars.com. Emails obtained by advocacy group Judicial Watch have exposed the fact that a senior New York Times employee who covers national security for the newspaper provided the CIA with advanced copies of an article another writer was preparing that was somewhat critical of the White House over the upcoming Hollywood film about the killing of Osama bin Laden. The reporter, Mark Mazzetti, forwarded an advanced copy of a Maureen Dowd column to a CIA spokesperson a full two days before it was set to be published. The article, published August 7, 2011, discussed the upcoming Catherine Bigelow, Mark Bowell film, Zero Dark Thirty, and criticized the Obama administration for having, quote, outsourced the job of manning up the president's image to Hollywood. Mazzetti's emails show that he sent the piece to the CIA's Marie Hoff on August 5th, 2011, writing, quote, This didn't come from me, and please delete after you read. See, nothing to worry about. So basically, the New York Times sends an article critical of the Obama administration and Obama himself related to the uh, propaganda surrounding the death of 